but the Bond series has long been made by solid but anonymous filmmakers like Terence Fisher and Lewis Gilbert. Like Terence Fisher, like Terence Fisher. Terence Fisher. What you're listening to is the voice of a fool, erroneously mixing James Bond director Terence Young with Hammer Horror director Terence Fisher. Many of you were quick to point out my error in the comments, and it's haunted me since. Minor corrections are always a little annoying. You know, if you tip the glass, there won't be so much foam on top. Sorry, Homer. But what kills me about this is I actually greatly admire and appreciate what Terrence Young did for 007. Bond directors may be anonymous craftsmen, but if you watch the movies enough, you start to really see the value individual filmmakers brought to the screen. And of the many directors who have helmed James Bond movies, no one added quite as much as Terrence Young. Between 1962 and 1965, Young directed three Bond films, Dr. No, From Russia With Love, and Thunderball. Seminal Bond pictures each, as we could also describe them within the series as the first one, the best one, and adjusted for inflation, the highest grossing one. With this video, I want to put Young's direction under a spotlight and consider how his filmmaking helped shape the identity of James Bond, both the character and the overall series. Dr. No is a lot like the 1931 adaptation of Dracula, a movie which overcomes some sluggish pacing because the central character is just so darn compelling. I am Dracula. Bond. James Bond. Reflecting on the film decades later, Terence Young attributed all of Dr. No's success to Sean Connery, Sean Connery, Sean Connery. Now this isn't strictly speaking inaccurate, but it undersells just how crucial Young was in directing Connery's performance. Popular perception of the late great Sean Connery is similar to that of Bond himself. Virulently masculine, but also suave, charming, and refined. But that wasn't true in 1962. Connery wasn't the cultured gentlemanly type. He was a working class football player from a rugged background. He certainly had the virulent masculinity, but it was Young who taught Connery how to behave like James Bond. How to carry himself in a suit. How to talk wines and food. How to hold a cigarette. By most accounts from cast and crew, Young thought of himself as James Bond, and he was the one who passed the sense of sophistication to Connery. This real style and the movement of the piece was um, Terence Young stamped all over it. Terence really took me in hand and uh, sort of knocked me into shape with this Taylor and Turnbull and Nassau's shirts and all the gear. Young would also inform Bond's dry wit. The script for Dr. No does contain some one-liners. Sergeant, make sure he doesn't get away. But it was Young who encouraged Connery's sarcastic delivery. From here, the two would find more places to squeeze in Bond's humor, believing this took some of the edge off and kept the character fun. You might notice that these three elements, the mix of rugged machismo, cultured elegance, and wry humor, are really the core pillars of Bond's personality. The ability to embody all three of these attributes is what makes Connery's performance so indelible. Other Bonds had the humor, the sophistication, and the toughness, but no one could do all three at once quite like Sean. His James could give you a lecture on fine wines, then beat you up and still leave you smiling with an understated quip. And while it's tempting to give all the credit to Connery, it was Terence Young's direction that really brought the character out. Consider too how Young introduces the character, deliberately obscuring his face through blocking or shooting from behind focusing instead on inserts of Bond's hands. Such stalling builds anticipation, with Connery bringing effortless cool to the revealing close-up. Mr. Bond, I suppose you wouldn't care to, um, raise the limit? I have no objection. Characterization is in fact one of Young's best skills, as Dr. No is littered with little touches that really flesh out its people. Joseph Wiseman's titular antagonist set the standard for all Bond villains, with his understated menace and arrogance. Even a relatively minor character like the villainous photographer is given detail through her licking the flashbulb, a Terence Young touch which wordlessly establishes a perverse, sexually charged sense of evil. But beyond directing actors, how did Young actually stage his scenes? Young himself claimed that he avoided master shots whenever he could, and as such, most scenes, whether dialogue or action, are built around singles of the actors. There's some basic camera movement, 
and Jung often uses a flat angle with some distance to the subject, taking an objective point of view on the action. The result is functional storytelling, if a bit dry. Take the scene where Bond is ambushed by Quarrel. The scene alternates between flat singles of the two men, a two-shot at a slight angle, and new setups for the reaction shot of the men thrown at a slight angle of an armed Bond triumphant. On a narrative level, we understand an ambush turned into a fight that Bond won, but it lacks dramatic impact. Quarrel's knife is signaled by a sound effect, but it's such a small part of the frame that we don't really feel it. And similarly, Feller's strength isn't shown visually, but through Quarrel's dialogue. Ain't no use you struggling. Us full of rascals alligators. We also don't get a shot showing the distance between Bond and Quarrel before Bond escapes, which reduces the victory's catharsis since we're not totally sure how much danger Bond is in. Even the climactic battle against Dr. No is rendered with distance, mostly consisting of wide shots where the two dudes awkwardly swing at each other until Bond gets away with relative ease. To be fair, I'm sure those cumbersome suits didn't help. And to be even fairer, this close-up of Dr. No's metal hands unable to grasp the bar is a nice touch. But for the most part, excitement in Dr. No comes less from Young's direction and more specific crew members. Editor Peter Hunt's aggressive cutting. Production designer Ken Adams' slightly surreal sets. Maurice Bender's innovative titles. And Monty Norman and John Barry's iconic music. Now this isn't to say Terence Young's more detached directorial style is flat out bad. At times, it actually works wonderfully. One of the best scenes in the film is when Bond traps Dr. No's assassin. Stop it, Professor. I'm behind you. The wide shot conveys Bond's power, while the eyeline match from Dent to his gun creates suspense, with Bond unaware of the danger he's in. But when Dent fires and realizes he's out of bullets, the wide shot is relieving like the film is taking a breath of air. Consider too Bond's relaxed posture, subtly telling us he always knew what was happening and never lost control of the situation. The single of Bond emphasizes his getting the last word, and you've had your six. while the final wide shot really stresses the cold-blooded nature of the action by distancing us from it. While the dialogue here gives us some exposition and dense death does advance the plot, Young shot selection is really what makes the scene, just an excellent example of expressing character and suspense through direction. Young also does take a more subjective view at times. Just before that last scene, Dent tries to assassinate Bond with a tarantula. Here, Young uses a series of very tight close-ups of both the spider crawling along Bond's body and Connery's sweat-drenched face, and this claustrophobic framing sells tremendous danger and discomfort. The wide shot when Bond finally bursts through and kills the spider is a cathartic release, while the size of the frame allows Connery to exaggerate his movements, which contrasts nicely with the stillness of the scene's buildup. I highlight this scene in particular because I think its style would greatly inform Young's direction moving forward. Here's a fun fact about Terence Young, he almost died on the set of From Russia With Love. When scouting locations, his helicopter crashed in a lake, with Young trapped inside for some time before the crew finally got him out. He returned to directing the film later that day. That's certainly the most dramatic onset struggle, but the whole film was a challenge, with Young having to turn a very convoluted screenplay into a coherent film that could top the surprise hit that was Dr. No. And he did. From Russia With Love was an even bigger smash than its predecessor, and over time has solidified its reputation as possibly the absolute best James Bond movie. If nothing else, Young himself considered it his best Bond movie and one of the best films he ever made. Easy to see why Young was proud, as he really upped his game as a director here. The leap is apparent from the opening scene. Rather than the series of dissolves which begin Dr. No rather slowly, from Russia With Love fades in on camera movement, tracking an armed Bond shrouded in darkness, immediately bringing us into the action. The movement is actually a pretty simple pan, but the combination of the angle and Connery moving vertically in the frame makes it feel a lot more exciting. The shadowy setting and use of more emphasized camera angles create a mysterious tone before we reveal our new villain. 
Grant doesn't say anything in this scene, but his quiet determination while stalking a clearly nervous Bond expresses what a dangerous foe he is. Even little details show improvement from Dr. No. While Quarrel's switchblade doesn't really resonate, the dramatic close-up of Grant's garrote wire establishes a much more deadly weapon. It's also crucial that we get a few frames to see Grant emerging from the shadows before going in for the kill, offering a second of sheer terror before killing James Bond. It's not really James, of course, but Young's direction, in context with a training exercise explicitly designed for killing Bond, introduces Grant as a dangerous antagonist. Moreover, it also announces the film as more of a sinister thriller, shifting away from Dr. No's detective procedural and into Hitchcockian suspense. The phrase Hitchcockian thriller is something of a cliché, but the core idea is that suspense derives from its audience knowing things that the characters don't. And this idea is manifest in Red Grant. Unbeknownst to Bond, Grant spends much of From Russia With Love operating from the shadows, shaping the narrative while remaining untouchable. His appearance at the camp shootout most strongly defines the character. With a low angle shot looking above, and a high angle from behind with Grant overlooking the action, both suggesting his godlike power over events. He holds Bond's life in his hands but ultimately rescues James, saving the spy for a later confrontation. And oh, what a confrontation it is. The fight scene between Bond and Grant on the Orient Express is markedly different than any fight in Dr. No, with Young foregoing his usual objective distance for claustrophobic close-ups and tight framing. This may well have been a byproduct of shooting in such close quarters, but the result is an absolutely brutal showdown as the two men desperately beat into each other. There's no space for fancy footwork, it's just raw violence. Some members of the crew actually worried Young had gone too far, but the result is one of the most viscerally intense scenes in all of Bond. The medium single we get when Bond finally overcomes is a much needed breather for both character and audience. The rest of the action scenes are perhaps more in line with what we might expect from Young, but we still see a glow up from Dr. No. I especially like how the big camp shootout is shot with Young's objective distance, with the edges of the frame surrounded in chaos as bodies flail all over the place. This does a great job mirroring Bond himself, who amidst the chaos is strategically able to pick his shots precisely. The resulting scene is both tremendously exciting, yet still clear narratively. Then there's all the overblown set pieces in Act 3. The helicopter scene is clearly trying to one-up the North by Northwest crop duster scene. I don't think it matches it in terms of imagery, but in terms of stunt work... Ew, there's some close calls. The boat chase is mostly just an excuse for some climactic bombast... But in both these scenes, Young's distance to the action really works given the level of spectacle which fills the frame. And while it's easy to mock the final fight, given it's a 6-2 Connery trying to stop a tiny old lady from kicking him, that the poison-tipped blade has been so pointedly established, and so thoroughly emphasized throughout the scene, makes this little skirmish highly suspenseful. And it's an appropriate end to From Russia With Love. For all the Bondian spectacle, it's that tension and suspense that Young mines from the story that really elevates the film. Terrence Young took a break from 007 and passed on movie 3, returning in 1965 for Thunderball. James Bond had changed a lot in this short time. While Dr. No and From Russia With Love were both big hits, Goldfinger was the true phenomenon, outgrossing both of its predecessors, launching a wave of merchandise, and helping solidify Bond as the peak action series of its day. Moreover, Goldfinger marked a major shift in Bond filmmaking, moving away from the relatively grounded thrills of From Rush With Love into far more outlandish and unapologetically cartoonish spectacle. Thunderball was a clear effort to top the spectacle, with even wilder gadgets and a massive underwater battle utilizing incredibly innovative filmmaking techniques. 
But with Young back behind the camera, we also see efforts to bring Bond back to Earth. The darker lighting and cooler color palette evoke a gritty sense of danger, and Young also moves away from some of Goldfinger's more absurd humorous touches. Even in the thick of grandiose action, Young seeks drama and excitement in the more human moments. Despite a finale which involves armies clashing underwater, a high-speed boat chase, and lots of explosions, the climax of Thunderball is another close-quarters punch-out. The shift in tone is perhaps best emphasized by comparing two scenes where Bond is in danger. In Goldfinger, Bond is strapped to a table, desperately trying to negotiate his way out as a laser threatens to slice him in half. In Thunderball, Bond escapes from the villains but is shot in the leg, and must now navigate through a parade while fleeing from his pursuers. Equally tense scenes, but Goldfinger derives its thrills from an otherworldly device, while Thunderball roots its tension in reality. Furthermore, while Goldfinger director Guy Hamilton clearly shot his scene on a soundstage, Terence Young takes to the streets of Nassau, with disorienting close-ups and a consistent shake further reinforcing the authenticity of Bond's peril. But beyond the action, there's something else Young does in Thunderball that he'd actually been developing throughout his tenure with 007, and it relates to Bond's humanity. In Dr. No, Bond is a more superhuman figure than an actual person, impossibly suave, intelligent, and capable. But starting in From Rush With Love, Young starts to show a more human side to James. Unlike the ultra-cool introduction of Dr. No, Bond's first scene here is in his underwear, sharing an intimate moment with his girlfriend Sylvia. There's definitely some masculine fantasy at play, and the idea of a car phone was complete science fiction in 1963. But there's also something very human in seeing our super spy hero in briefs. Throughout the film, Young is also careful to highlight Bond's glimmers of humanity, his protection of Tatiana, his grief over Kevin Bay's murder. These aren't major aspects of the story, but subtle hints of Bond's empathy and this reaches its peak for Young in Thunderball. As they lie on the beach, James finally reveals to Domino that her brother has been killed by the film's villain, Emile Largo. Young uses a close-up of the brother's watch and dog tags in Connery's trembling hand, which wavers all the more as Domino takes the items. With tears scrolling down Domino's face, James's voice quivers, and he quickly puts on a pair of glasses, presumably to hide his own tears. Through simple but direct shot choices, performance, and a key prop, Terence Young has imparted Bond's humanity and vulnerability. Decades later, Bond movies like GoldenEye and Casino Royale would receive a lot of praise for treating James Bond as a real character with psychological depth. But look at how much humanity Young was able to capture in the 1960s, not through long dialogue scenes laying out Bond's psychological profile, but purely through his direction of the actors and his shot selection. Young was exposing Bond's humanity long before such deconstruction was in vogue. So I hope I've successfully highlighted just how much Terence Young helped shape 007. He might not have been an auteur filmmaker, but his direction largely defined the character of James Bond, the series standards for humor and action, and the underlying humanity that makes Bond such an indelible hero. And of course, Terence Young had a long, accomplished career outside of Ian Fleming's spy adventures. He also directed movies like Wait Until Dark, Red Sun, They Were Not Divided, No Time to Die? No time to die. Huh. Point is, Terence Young was a pretty good director. And if nothing else, he deserved better than having his name messed up by some twerp on YouTube. You fucking dumbass.